uh, Toby. Um, appreciate uh, seeing you all here tonight. We're going to have a few challenges tonight that we don't always have. Um, the uh, waiters and waitresses have a lot more work to do, so I just ask you know, that we help them do the job as much as they can and concentrate at the same time. They will have to talk from time to time. They will have to talk um, so they can be heard. They will be competing with me from time to time. I just ask you uh, to um, concentrate as, as best you can. Um, if you go to Independence Reform Bible Church where I pastor, just pretend you're in the church on a Sunday morning and you're going to war with all the uh, kid noises that we have all over the place in that church. Those of you who attend know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, which, um, which are music to our ears, of course. All right, uh, tonight's uh, presentation, Who Would Jesus Tax? The theology of taxation from Scripture. I won't ask for a raise of hands, but whoever, whoever thought that there could be such a thing as the theology of taxation. But there is. And we aim to demonstrate that tonight. As always, we will allow for questions at the end of our presentation this evening. So I hope you're thinking of questions as we, as we go along. Who would Jesus tax? Well, speaking of that, this week you may have seen this new research. I, I like the way this is titled from uh, Pastor Chuck Baldwin. New research, pastor to, pastors deliberately keeping flock in the dark. I, I love the way it says, new research. <laughs> it's new research, but it's definitely not new knowledge. George Barnett is the foremost researcher of modern Christianity in the country. He recently spoke about a two-year two -year research project. This was not any of a weekend project. A two-year project studying why modern-day pastors and churches are so silent regarding political issues. And let us just say... <coughs> that the Bible didn't speak about political issues and we would be wrong to speak about ourselves, especially in church. But the Bible said nothing. The result of his research only confirms what I, Chuck Baldwin, have been trying to tell people for years. But there was one thing his research uncovered that did somewhat surprise me. And he goes on to say, quoting the story from onenewsnow.com, and I looked up the original story. On Thursday, George Barnum, research expert and founder of the Barnum Group, shared with American Family Radio's today's issues about new information he's compiling over the last two years, gauging where theologically conservative pastors are at politically. Theologically, theologically conservative, okay? We aren't talking to uh, Ms. Pastorette from Lancaster Theological Left Wing Seminary here. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about theologically conservative pastors here, all right? Keep that in mind. What we're finding is that when we ask them about all the key issues of the day, 90% of them are telling us, yes, the Bible speaks to every one of these issues. And of course, tonight, taxation is one of them. Then we ask them, well, are you teaching your people what the Bible says about those issues? And the numbers drop to 80%. Go lower. 70 60. Question again was, question was, why, since you know the Bible speaks to these issues, why are you not speaking to them? And we find out the percentage of pastors who do speak to these. 50%? Less than 10%. Less than 10%. Less than 10% of pastors who say they will speak to it. When researchers ask these pastors what they are willing to do to get their people active in the process, Barna said it's almost nothing. So the thing that struck me, this is the article again, has been that when we talk about the separation of church and state, it's that churches have separated themselves from the activities of the state, and that's to the detriment of the state and its people, stated the researcher. Question. Who is the most effective prophet evangelist in all of Scripture? I'm talking all the New Testaments. You might go to Peter. Not bad. 3,000 in one day. 
That'd be something to send home to the supporting churches, right? <laughs> that, that would crank up the offering. I would argue the most successful evangelist prophet in all scripture, you know who I'm going to say? Jonah. Got the, most, got the most for his money, right? Shortest sermon ever. Most converts. An entire city. Question. Was Jonah a separation of church and state kind of a guy? Not hardly. 40 days and 40 nights, and Nineveh will be destroyed. Does that sound like, uh, does that sound like we're kind of uh, speaking to the state here? Your, your, your city is done in 40 days. Jonah, very successful. That 90% of America's pastors are not addressing any of the salient issues affecting Christian uh, people's political or societal lives should surprise no one, especially the readers of this column. It has been decades since even a sizable minority of pastors have bothered to educate and inform their congregations as to the biblical principles relating to America's political, cultural, and societal lives. But the part of the research that did somewhat surprise me, this is Chuck Baldwin again, was a statement by Barna. What we're finding is that when we ask them about all the key issues of the day, 90% of them are telling us, yes, the Bible speaks to every one of these issues. Then we ask them, well, are you teaching your people? Are you teaching your people what the Bible says about those issues? And the numbers drop to less than 10% of the pastors who say they will speak to it. What is up? What is up with that? Let me ask you this question. Do you think there's consequences when our pastors who stand behind the Word of God and preach, do you think there's consequences in the church and in the society if they don't preach the whole counsel of God? Or do you think we can just go ahead and skip over entire passages and entire books and ah, everything's the same, no problem? What do you think? We know the scriptures say my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, tonight, who would Jesus tax? I'll start out by saying that we're going to get away from the cliches tonight. Cliché being, hey, if the government says to do it, I, you, you must do it. Do you ever think of Daniel? Daniel was told not to pray towards Jerusalem. Or, well, actually not to pray towards Jerusalem. To pray to his, to his God. As soon as he hears it, he goes and he prays. Now, was Daniel told anywhere in the law, anywhere in the Old Testament, that he had to pray towards Jerusalem three times a day? The answer is no. What do you think we would, what, what do you think today's Christian leadership would tell Daniel today? Yo, Dan, it's only 30 days. And it's not like you're going against anything that we've been taught here. Dan, you're a you're high up in the government. We, we really need you, Dan. So just knock it off with your principle, whatever it is. Relax and just take a break for 30 days, because that's all it really was, was 30 days. Daniel, though, he prays towards Jerusalem. Why? How can he do that if he's supposed to obey the government, whatever the government says? <clears throat> Because Daniel knows something that our pastors and our Christian leadership doesn't know or actually does know and refuses to, refuses to teach. And that is, Daniel knows that that king had no jurisdiction, no responsibility, and no authority whatsoever to tell him who he could pray to. It was completely beyond his jurisdiction. Completely. Tonight, this issue of taxes... I want to bring up something. How many of you are familiar with the history of the Ukraine, Ukraine's back in the news, between 1929 and 1932 and what happened there? Any, and I see, a, I see a few hands. Yeah, absolutely. The Harvest of Sorrow by Robert Conquest is a full history of one of the most horrendous human tragedies of the 20th century. Between 1929 and 1932, the Soviet Communist Party struck a double blow at the Russian peasantry. Dekulikization. We could talk about that later if you want to know what that means. It basically means fist. And Stalin, Stalin had, had, had basically said that the, we don't have food. He had ruined, he had ruined the economy of, uh, of, of 
what was on Russia. He had ruined it. And then he blamed the lack of food on the farmers. Now that is really seriously getting sent away with something, isn't it? The reason why we don't have food is those thinking farmers are hoarding it all. That's what he said. Wow. Okay. And, and the abolition of private ownership of land and the concentration of the remaining peasants in party-controlled collective farms. This was followed in 1932 to 33 by a terror famine inflicted by the state on the collectivized peasants of the Ukraine and certain other areas by setting impossibly high grain quotas, removing every other source of food, and preventing help from outside, even from other areas of the Soviet Union. The death toll resulting from the actions described in this book, Conquest Book, Harvest of Sorrow, describing the Ukraine famine, was an estimated 14.5 million, more than the total number of deaths, for all countries in World War I. Now why am I referencing this in a talk about taxation? Simply this, we hear it all the time, pay your taxes, pay whatever they tell you. All right, Stalin came along to the Ukrainian peasants and said, you pay me all your taxes, you pay me everything you have, I want your grain, I want everything that you used to eat, I'm taxing you everything. How many folks that glibly say, "Go oh, just pay your taxes, whatever they say, how many pay that ta those taxes? Tell you what, <laughs> your baby is hard enough to sleep with when it's full and just doesn't want to go to sleep. I've never heard the sound of a starving to death baby, but that would be something hard to take. And you think these people that glibly say, oh, just pay, pay because they have whatever pay, would they, do you think they say it in that situation? And I have challenged, and this is one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about this, I have challenged those people who said to me, hey, Joel, you're all wet. You're, you're trying to teach the theology of taxation? Just pay whatever the government says. And I said, okay, are you going to absolutely pay whatever Stalin said you had to pay, which was everything? You're not going to maybe try to hold a little bit back and put it in your pocket? Oh no, you're going to be a good Christian and you're going to give them everything and your family's going to starve to death. Please, enough of the hypocrisy. Knock it off. Well, who would Jesus tax? Is taxation some considerations that we have to start with? And forgive us for the, um, it's, it goes off the edge a little bit. Is taxation a moral issue? Either in fact or amount or both? Well, is the fact of taxation a moral issue, and is the amount a moral issue? One or the other? The fact is a moral issue, but the amount is not? Or both? You need to ask that. If no, what are the implications? The implications are, if taxation itself is not a moral issue, we have no business talking about it from the scriptures. If yes, May we assume the Bible speaks to this issue either directly or indirectly? Of course, the answer is yes. What does it say? If it does speak, do we have an obligation to proclaim what it says? Easily answered. Opening assumptions. Yes, the Bible does speak to the issue of taxation. Haven't you ever heard of, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's? Yeah, 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 I remember that now. That's pretty much every sermon I've ever heard on taxation. See, it says, render to Caesar things that are Caesar's. And that's the end of that. You can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. Actually, no, you can't. The Bible says what it says. I can't make it say anything. Yeah, I'll listen, but don't quote the Old Testament. That doesn't apply to the church. I would like to know what it does apply to then. We, we just wiped out the Old Testament to the church. What's left? We're always told, when you go to, when, 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 when Christians go to confront the secular pagans of the world, you know one of the things we hear from our other Christian friends? You can't talk to them. That, you, the, the Bible's meant for Christians. You can't quote the Bible to unbelievers. Well, apparently you can't quote the Old Testament to believers. Why are we talking about taxes? We should just preach the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Which of the Old Testament prophets didn't preach the gospel? 
And which of the Old Testament prophets didn't confront kings when they sinned? Are you going to tell me that when they were confronting kings and wicked people, and mostly confronted kings, others as well, but mostly kings, Jeremiah, with his confrontation against Zedekiah, Zedekiah and all the court people, again and again and again, are you going to tell me that when he was confronting the king, that he wasn't preaching the gospel? He was taking a break from the gospel to go confront the king? You know, these people say, we just preach the gospel. I don't even know if they know what they're talking about. I, I, I truly don't know. Because if you ask them what they think the gospel is, I bet you'd get the craziest answer you ever heard. Maybe they pull out a track of four spiritual laws. You know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan, of your, plan for your life. And on and on. I don't know. The Bible's got 66 books. That's a lot more than um, a gospel track. What we believe the Bible clearly teaches, now hang on to your hats for this one. This is where you're going to get uh, want to get red, get your pen, pen and pencil out, or make sure that you have a um, tough tonight, clear path to the exit. All right. <laughs> First of all, the tax issue is often addressed in Scripture. Often, you don't believe me? Go home and do a blue letter Bible study, more tax and taxes. You'll find it in the Bible under tax, under words like tribute. The family, secondly, is the only institution that is biblically qualified to take risks and make a profit. <coughs> That's it. The church is not qualified to take risks and make a profit. The state is not qualified to take risks and make a profit. Only the family. The Bible does not allow for direct force taxation on God's people ever. Oh, now, here's, here, here we go. I made this comment um, when we got, got, had a chance to speak to the uh, Berks County Tea Party Patriots folks. Boy, did, didn't they just look at me like I crawled out from under a rock? I don't, even, I don't even think they heard what I said. We are so used to the idea of forced taxation in this country. We, we are fine with the idea that they can come with a gun and take away our money. I'm telling you right now, I mean, you're going to have more time with us, some of you. I know, I know you are. But I'm telling you right now, we never have, under godly rule and godly leadership, forced taxation. We have taxation, but we don't have forced taxation. I believe that God wanted, God took a talent from the, um, from the men under Moses. I believe he did. They owed it. Now, please stick with me on this. There's a difference between owing something and being forced to pay it. Example, the tithe to your local church. Right? It may be owed, but you see your pastor coming around with a shotgun to make you pay it? There's a difference. One of the, one of the great victories of the Scottish Covenanters, I used to, I used to, this used to really confuse me. I, I, I would read about these pastors that were dumped on through the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church. They get these pastors dumped on them, and the pastors were drunks, and they didn't show up to church for sometimes six months at a time. And when they did, they were drunk in the pulpit, and then they didn't show up for another six months. It's like, how in the world can you support that? I don't know how you can support that. Forced tithe payment, which is what the Anglicans did. It'd be pretty easy. Hey, you know, if you're being forced to pay the tithe, why not get drunk if you're a godless, if you're a godless man? We never have a statement, and we have all kinds of statements from God to Moses in the Bible. We never have a statement that goes something like this. And the Lord said to Moses, speak unto the children of Israel that they pay such and such amount of taxes. And if they don't, go after them with a spear and make them do it. We just, we just don't have, we, we may have taxes, we may, I, th I actually think we do under Moses, but we don't have a method of forcing them to pay. And don't tell me it's because God didn't, th didn't think of it. There's all kinds of penalties throughout the Old Testament for doing, committing certain sins and crimes. Crimes, I should say. All kinds of penalties. There was not a penalty in the scriptures for not paying the tax. It's not there. Watch the door. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay. Forced taxation and apostasy are usually seen together. You don't believe me? Do a study on that one. Hopefully we'll demonstrate that tonight. Only God is qualified to define taxation limits. That's like an understatement, right? Anybody, any, anybody besides God qualified to define taxation limits? Stalin defined it as 100%. Those who will not address taxes, either specifically or generally, show that they do not recognize the priority of the family. We're going to demonstrate tonight that taxes aim directly at the family. <coughs> the ability of the family to get and maintain wealth. Furthermore, they show that loving the neighbor is not a priority. Oh, I, I can't say about taxes. If they tax my neighbor into oblivion, hey, that's not my problem. Hey, where's your love for your neighbor? Think about it. Finally, they deny that God is God of the society as well as God of the individual, the family, and the church. See, that's the kind of God we have today, isn't it? He's God of my personal life inside here. Out there, he's not God. We'll turn that over to the Canaanites. And they can control things. And call ourselves spiritual for doing it. Wow. No, he's the God out there, just like he's in here. All right, three main passages tonight. First Samuel 8, that's the main passage. But of course I had to deal with Matthew 22, 15 through 22, which is the render to Caesar uh, passage. You have to deal with that. And Romans 13, 1 through 7. So what, what we're trying to do tonight is deal with the first passage that um, I think lays it out. But if we don't deal with these two passages... Uh, Matthew and Romans, if we don't deal with them, someone's going to say, hey, what about the render to Caesar passage, and what about the Romans 13 passage? So, stick with me if you would. Let's read together what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is towards the end of the Judges. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of the first born born was Joel. What born was that? And the name of the second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. Remember those three items. Dishonest gain, bribes, perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel of Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge over us like the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of all the people and let they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Dangerous spot. Can we agree? Whatever happens next is not going to be good. We think we don't want God to reign over us. Let's make an improvement. Let's get mad. That should work out. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doomed to you also. Now therefore, heed their voice. However, this is critical, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the world words of the Lord to the people who asked for a king. Now what happens next is really, really important. Because what's happening is Samuel is going to show them what it's like to have a king that rejects God. What do you think that would look like? Well, we'll have to use our imagination. And he said, and I'm asking you to try, to try to remember these specifics as much as you can. This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants and your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants, and you will cry out on that day because of the kingdom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice, voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king to reign over us. 
that we may also be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out and before us and fight our battles. Check it out that our king may judge us and fight our battles. Think about that, please. We are introducing here a new standard of right and wrong. From now on, our king is going to establish what's right and wrong. Not God anymore, not the scriptures. Our king's going to do it. <coughs> we are on shaky ground here. Oh, by the way, here's the price we'll pay, though. Just so long as the king goes out and fights our battles for us. You know, supports us. From cradle to grave, maybe. Well, let's go back to what Samuel said. Let's go through this one at a time. He said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take. Take. The first thing Samuel says is, your king is going to take. You know, you want a king who's going to do, what, do something for you? I'll tell you what he's going to do. First thing. This king is going to be in the taking business. What's he going to take? I don't know, my leftover coffee grounds? Well, how's this for taking? How's this for destroying the future of the family? Samuel gets right into it. First thing he's taking is the thing that's most valuable to you. First thing, sons, daughters, best fields. He'll take the 40 acres on the bottom. You're going to have the rocky ones at the top, if you want. Your vineyards, your olive groves. And guess who's going to get them? His servants. He'll take a tenth of your grain and sheep. He'll take your male servants and female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys or your work implements. He's not going to waste it. He's going to put them to his work, and you shall be his servants. He's not going to waste it. I got a kick out of, out, out, out of my, my conservative friends. Bless their hearts. Bless their dear hearts. They say, oh, look at all this waste in government spending. Hello? They're not wasting it. Not by their standard. They're buying votes. What's wasteful about buying votes? You ever wonder how they stay in, in, in office again and again? So we see it as waste, which is horrible. They're not wasting it. They're buying votes to stay in power. Yeah, he'll put it to his work. You shall be his servants. Now, let's see what's going to happen. This taking. I mean, wow. Well, this was well, this is what the king is going to get that he didn't have before. Thanks to you. He's got chariots, horsemen. He's going to have an entourage, captains. He's going to have his field plow. He's going to get harvests. He's going to have guys that have handle his weapons. Uh, weapons, maintain his weapons, perfumers, cooks, bakers, servants, officers, do his work in general, and he will have ultimate domination over you. How is he getting, let me ask you something, my friends, how is he getting it? He's getting it through the tax. He's not getting it. <clears throat> well, let's see how it worked out. They said, okay, yeah, we still want a king. Let's fast forward to 1 Samuel 22. Please stick with me here on these, on these details because it's critical. When Saul heard, now this is after, after David has killed Goliath, that was in 1 Samuel 17. Saul has become jealous of David is trying to kill him. Alright? Saul the king trying to kill David. When Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered, they were looking for David, they finally found him. Saul was staying in Gibeah under a tamarisk tree in Ramah. Look, get, get this picture of Saul. This guy's going to go out and fight your battles and delivery and all this kind of stuff. This guy you wanted, who's now taxing your lights out. This is what he looks like. Under a tamarisk tree in Ramah, with his spear in his hand, hanging out under the tree, spear in hand, and all the servants standing about him. So he's got the entourage going on there. Pretty royal, pretty regal. Then Saul said to his servants, Here now, you Benjamites. Now watch this. Watch what Saul is doing with all that booty he taxed out of the Israelites. Watch what he's doing. Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? 
Uh-huh, okay, it's come a little clear, isn't it? Well then, hey, why are you guys protecting David? He's not going to give you fields and vineyards like I will. He's not going to give you bureaucratic positions that pay all kinds of money for doing nothing like I will. <coughs> I, I'm the guy that's handing out the goodies. Now, that, that little thing there, every one of you fields and vineyards, do you think, you think Saul's reaching into his own pocket and handing out from his own little farm fields and vineyards and dividing up the family plot? You might remember that when Saul, when we first find him, they, Saul was out looking for a one donkey that his family had lost, and so we know that he was so poor that one donkey made a big difference. We know they spent all day looking for the donkey, and we know that he didn't even have a servant to go looking for him. Saul was a poor man when he came to the kingship. <clears throat> Guess what? He's not so poor now, is he? He's doing pretty good. Old Saul. All you have conspired, watch this, against me. No one reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there's not one of you who is sorry, sorry for me. Or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait. Then answered Dog the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul. See what's happening here? See what's going on? Saul has his servants. Guess who's in charge of the servant? Whether they're Israelite like brothers? Doeg the Edomite, a traditional enemy of the Israelites, is now over the servants of Saul. So you thought you thought you were going to go work for Saul and deliver you from the enemies. Find out you're working for Doeg the Edomite. Wow. What if, what if the lights are coming on? We're getting a clue. He says, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob to Ahimelech. He inquired of the Lord and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. What had happened before when David was on the run from Saul, he went into the priest. The priest gave him something to eat and gave him the Goliath's sword, which was on display. So the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitab and all his father's house, the priests who were in Nob. They all came to the king and said, Saul. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahitub. He answered, Here I am, my lord. Then Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, and that you have given him bread and a sword, and inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day? Listen to what the poor Ahimelech says. Ahimelech thinks he and Saul are on the same side. Ahimelech, this priest, says, uh, no, um, and who among all your servants are as faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law, who goes at your bidding and is honorable in your house? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Or be it for me, let not the king impute anything to his servant, meaning me, or to any in the house of my father. For your servant knew nothing of this little or much. I didn't know he was running away from you, Saul. I just want to help him, and by the way, he's very loyal to you. And the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Do you see Saul's first target once he gained power and once he gained money? His first target was the family and the church. In one fell swoop, I, th th this is an inspired book we're dealing with here. Because we see what Saul did with his power. He aimed it right at the family and the church all in one shot. Why? Because the family and the church are, are, are um, competing power sources for a state that wants to control everything. And here he goes right at him. And he does. He kills all the priests. And he hates the family because he kills all the priests and all the children. Doesn't just stop the priests. Kills the wives, kills the children. This is Saul the deliverer. Wow. In the end, they got what they started with. Samuel's sons were all about dishonest gain, bribes, and the perversion of justice. That's why they had a problem. No more bribes, perversion of justice. Frustrated with this situation, apparently they rejected God and chose a king, a king that was all about dishonest gain, bribes, and perversion of justice. Only now they had a tax burden to go along with it. And an entrenched bureaucracy that's not going to let them out of it. How easy it was would have been to deal with Samuel's sons.
try dealing with Saul and all his power now. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Now, let me back up there a little bit before we go on to Matthew. Where did the problem start? They ended up with tremendous oppression with the king taxing their lights out. And by the way, I frankly look at what Samuel said sometimes, and I said, he's going to take a tenth? I'm like, give me that king compared to what we got now. I vote for Saul. What about Saul for President Bumper Sticker? Only a tenth? But where did the problem start? The problems did not start in society. Where did they start? They started in the church. They started in the ecclesiocracy, if you will. They started with Eli's sons before Samuel's sons, and then they, then they went on to Samuel's sons. That's where it started, my friends. We are never going to challenge the wickedness that is going on in our high places if we don't get the church to get behind it and to get it done. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen. You know, they say, well, oh, you know, I, I, I talked to a pastor about this one. He said, hey, he said, I don't care if individuals want to, want, you know, want to confront the, the powers that be, but I don't want to do this as a church. Hire one. Yep. Sees the wolf coming. Gets out of Dodge. All right. The one you've all been waiting for. Rather to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in this talk. They sent to him and their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Wow. <laughs> Jesus never saw them coming. <laughs> <laughs> Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. I, I'm so jealous when I read this kind of thing, you know. How, how many times I've been in an argument, I just, just a killer argument, and uh, the other person comes back. I've never been in an argument where I just said, said something this brilliant, and they just kind of like walked off. Uh, never. Uh, maybe never will happen. I'm so jealous, so jealous of that. All right. Um, let's look at what this passage is teaching. It is clear from this passage that Caesar is owed something. Let's understand that. Render to think Caesar the things that are Caesar. Caesar is owed something. God is owed something. The ones asking the question were not concerned with the glory of God and the reign of the Son. Let's remember that. I think they were like, oh, teacher, we, we really want to know. You have a discussion, and we're not really sure. It wasn't that. They were trying to trap them. They weren't looking for an answer. Christ showed them that they were hypocrites because they already were serving Caesar. How do we know they were already serving Caesar? Do you remember when Christ was crucified? Remember what they said to Pilate? Remember that? Yo, Pi, uh, you got to get rid of this guy because if you don't get rid of this guy, we're going to go back to Caesar and tell him that you're not his friend. So, so Pilate, Pilate, may I call you Pi, uh, nuzzle up here and, 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 and you know, Get rid of this Jesus guy. And then you and us and Caesar can all get along like we used to. What hypocrites. So, since it is clear that some things belong to Caesar, we must ask, what things? I'm going to ask for, I don't usually do this, I'm going to ask for a raise of hands. How many have you ever heard a, this sermon preached on, this, this, ser, this passage teaching, you must pay your taxes, just, just pay your taxes. How many of you have ever heard this sermon preached on? Yeah, most of you. How many of you have ever heard the pastor ask, what 
belongs to Caesar. Ever. Not touching it. Don't you think it might be the first thing you might want to ask? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. What things? Eh, whatever. Let's go on to the next verse. Let's have another session on whatever. What things belong to God? On whose authority, Caesar's or God's? Okay, something belongs to Caesar. On whose authority, Caesar's? Caesar's just wake up and say, you know, a new rule? Something belongs to me? Or is that God's authority that says Caesar is owed something? Whom do we ask what belongs to Caesar, God or Caesar? <coughs> so we want to find out what Caesar is owed. Who do we ask? Hint, not Caesar. Wrong guy. And I, I, I love, I, I, I love this. Uh, you know, Caesar. Caesar doesn't come asking anyway, does he? It's time to pay out. Caesar comes telling. What does Caesar owe God? Can you raise yourself that? Do you think Caesar has his own little separate domain in which he's king, and he doesn't have to deal with Christ? Or does Caesar owe Christ what everyone owes him? His absolute submission and worship. Caesar owes that to God. He has no independent jurisdiction whatsoever apart from the word of Christ. None. None. No independence here. We're all subject to Christ. Finally, we get into insight into this passage through the employment of the to-be verb. Now here's where you're going to be glad you're paying attention in English class. They said to him, Caesar's, and he said to them, render, Caesar, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Already are. Because of what I've declared. Not the things that Caesar says are going to be his by some new law. The things that already are. And who gets to declare what belongs to Caesar? What is Caesar's? Only Christ. That's it. No, no democracy here. The use of this verb tells us that God, that this is God's ordinance. He defines the things that are. That Caesar is owed anything is due to God's decree. If Caesar is owed something, it's because God says so. That's it. <clears throat> All right, Romans 13. You've really been waiting for this one. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. We're going to do this a little bit differently. This is our last passage of the evening, or almost last. Um, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Okay, three points. All legit authority is connected to God. There's no legitimate authority that's not connected to God somewhere. No independent authority. I don't care if it's in your church, or if it's in your home, dads or moms, or in the state. All is connected to God through Christ. Secondly, the state is not independent from God. If God has decreed that the state should exist, how can we possibly say the state is independent from God? Think about it. How, how is it? This amazing thing. It's, it's amazing to me. You have, you have believers, you have Christian people saying, well, we believe in separation. We can't tell them, right? Well, wait a minute. Who established the state to begin with? How can you say that God established a state and then we have nothing to do with the state if we're the church? The state was established by God. To resist the authority is to resist God. God set up the authority. It's not saying he set up every little thing that the king ever said. Let me ask you something. Was that a legitimate uh, command, if you will, or directed by Herod to kill all the babies? Clearly not. Clearly not. So let's get away from this idea that just because the king opens his mouth, that must be God telling us what to do. It wasn't true for Daniel, it wasn't true for Herod. And it certainly wasn't true for John the Baptist, who told Herod off by saying, hey, you can't have your brother's wife. 
Aaron says, who are you? We know who John was. He was a prophet of God, and he had the right and the responsibility to tell Herod off. Secondly, for rulers are not a terror to good works, please get this, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Rulers, the state, the job of the state is to terrorize the workers of evil. That's it. It's not to make sure that all the washing machines are the same price so the poor people can own one. It's not to make sure that everybody has a quality education. Are you kidding me? No. They exist to terrorize wicked people. Those who practice evil should be terrified. Here's, here's a little, little bit of insight. I know this is not news, but in any society, somebody's always going to be terrified of something. Either the wicked are going to be terrified to do evil, or the righteous are going to be terrified to do righteous things. Those who do good will not be afraid of civil magistrates who fear and acknowledge God. I, this is another frustrating thing. People say, oh, Joel, you know, you want, you want, to, you want to bring back Moses. Well, no, I, I don't want to bring back Moses. Necessarily. I want to bring back, how about all 66 books? Okay? How about if we apply all of them? All the ones that speak to the social and political sphere, bring them all back. How about the whole counsel of God to this thing? They say, oh, man, that'd be really terrible if we, if we applied the Bible. Hey, you know what? Paul's saying those who do good will not be afraid of doing good if you have godly civil magistrates. This is not rocket surgery, as someone said, for brain science. <laughs> for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. Don't you, don't you love that? That's such like, like a breath of fresh air. The, 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 the most honest thing, the most wonderful thing, if you do evil, be afraid. Yes! Head for the hills, head for the tall grass, get out of Dodge. For he does not bear the sword in vain, capital punishment, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Two things. The civil magistrate serves God. Did you know that? The civil magistrate's first job is to serve God. Says it. He is, look at, he is God's minister. Not even the people. Not even the majority of the people. God. Secondly, we have two motivations to do good. One internal and one external. See it? Look at that. Wrath, external, conscience, internal. Romans teaches us. For because of this, oh, here we are, you also pay taxes. For because of this, you also pay taxes. You see what Paul is saying here? Paul just laid out the reasons why we pay taxes. This is right here in the Bible, folks. I'm not making it up. It was here when I got here. It'll be here long after I'm gone. Paul laid out the reasons why we pay taxes so that the civil magistrate can terrorize evildoers. That's it. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. If you didn't get it the first time, Paul's saying the second time. This is why you pay taxes. They attend to this very thing, terrorizing evildoers. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes, custom to custom, fear to fear, honor to whom honor. Here we have the, here we have the reason why we pay taxes. Again, the tense of the to be verb helps us understand that the payment of taxes is based on God's ordinance, not man. For they are God's ministers, render therefore to all their due, they are due this, not because they said so. Now I get a kick out of it. Oh, Romans 13, oh, was Paul, you know, he served under Nero, and so now that's, that, 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 that matters. Come on, it's in the Bible. Who cares who he's serving under? Finally, to wrap up, a question that always comes up. So I'm going to stop this one ahead of time. 
is Morris advocating that people refuse to pay their taxes. Hey, Joel, you know, can I not pay my taxes? Can say you told me to do it. Well, what is meant by they are taxes? Their taxes or your taxes can only mean the taxes that the ultimate authority figure requires you to pay. That's your taxes. Any compulsion to pay taxes for any other reason is a perversion of justice and an attack on the family. Why is it an attack on the family? Because the family is the one that has to pay. That's why. And we all know what happens when they get the tax money and what happens to the family after that. You know what Proverbs 13.22 says? A good man, you remember it, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Have you ever heard of an inheritance tax? That is a direct attack on the family. And think about it. It says a good man leaves inheritance to his children's children. If you tax his money away, you're attacking his goodness. <clears throat> to say again, as we wrap up, we believe the Bible clearly teaches the tax issue is often addressed in Scripture. The family is the only institution that's biblically qualified to take risks and make a profit. The Bible does not allow for direct forced taxation on God's people, ever. Forced taxation, uh, let me qualify that, it does allow it as a judgment. It definitely does that as a judgment. Not God's way. Forced taxation and apostasy are usually seen together. See that in, in Saul, for example. Only God is qualified to define taxation limits. Those who will not address taxes, either specifically or generally, show they do not recognize the priority of the family. Forced taxation hurts the family. Who cares? Let's go off to another family conference while our families are taking a licking. Well, let's have a conference anyway. Okay, I'm not against family conferences. I think I attended one once or twice. Um, did we ever attend a family conference here? Just say yes. <laughs> Make you look good. Yeah, we probably have. We made up our own. I know that it's much. Been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have family conference every every night. All right. Um, further, not every night. Furthermore, they show that loving the neighbor is not a priority. Finally, they deny that God is the God of the society as well as God of the individual, the family, and the church. We're happy saying that God is the God of the family. We're good with that. We're happy saying God is the God of the church. Did I say the church? Family. The family and the church. We have problems. We say God is the God of society. In Christian circles, we got a big fat problem right there. Let's all be pluralistic. As if God and Buddha and, I don't know, Stalin? I don't know. Are all sitting around a nice big table. And let's all be pluralistic. Let's all just have a place at the table. And you know, we can dialogue together because we're all equal and we're all pluralistic here. No, not at all. You know, we talk about a place at the table. Christ owns the table, and everyone sitting at that table will one day bow to Christ. There's no equality going on here between Christ and everybody else. Who would Jesus tax? Well, we looked at 1 Samuel 8, Matthew 22, Romans 13, there's other passages we didn't have time. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention tonight. Let's crowd it. Thank you again.